Good morning. And I want to welcome everyone here, students, faculty, staff, friends, those joining us today online as part of Truett Chapel. And just knowing that from time to time, my mom does scroll on Facebook and see that we're having chapel, I want to say, hi, mom. <laughs> Uh, it's good to be together here this morning for this time of worship. It is good to see faces, people that I've come to know and love. This is a celebration not only of students and the work they have done here in the seminary, but an opportunity for us as a community to gather together and to worship our Lord and so as we begin this time of worship together, I invite you to pray with me as uh, we turn our hearts, our minds, our whole selves towards God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord of all creation, maker of heaven and earth, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we enter your presence with gladness, for all you have made is good. As we come before you to worship, as we enter into your courts, as we lift our voices in song, as we open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to you, grant us your grace, your strength, your wisdom, your guidance and your power. We confess you as our creator. We confess you as our redeemer. We confess you as the one who sanctifies us, sustains us, preserves us, and as the one who alone brings ultimate peace, justice, restoration, and renewal. In a word, salvation. If we turn towards you, if we behold you as you truly are, we are compelled to lay our hearts low, to fall upon our faces and to admit we are unworthy, that we do not honor you as we ought, that we fail you, we sin, we serve other gods, we do not love our neighbor as ourselves, we do not keep your commands, and yet, where we are faithless, you, O oh God, are faithful. And by your great, unending, and unceasing mercy, you have unleashed the power of new creation through the life, death, resurrection, and reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have undone death. You have cast down the devil. You have disarmed the powers, principalities, and authorities. You have renewed your covenant. You have extended your salvation to those who were once far off. You have taken our hearts of stone and given us hearts of flesh. You have mended bone and sinew and muscle and flesh, and you have moved us from death, death in our transgressions and sins, to life, life in and through Christ and through the Holy Spirit who indwells us and who has sealed us for the day of your redemption. Your work of new creation is evidenced here. All we need do is look around and witness those you have gathered as our brothers and sisters in Christ. You have anointed, appointed, called, and equipped us for your kingdom work. You have gathered us to worship. We trust you are sanctifying us, even making us perfect and complete in your love. We know one day you will glorify us, and welcome us to your banquet table in the city of God, the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and new earth. We wait for that day. We hope in it. Give us patience, Lord. Grant us diligence as workers in your field. And as we wait, and as we work, remake us in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. May we adore him and worship him this hour 
and discover our hearts being made new. We pray these things in Jesus' name. The worthy one, the honored one. Amen. Amen. Will you please stand as we begin our singing this morning? We're going to sing Our God. The words are printed in your order of worship. And then after that, we're going to sing hymn number 500 in your hymnal. And then I will keep on going. Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness Into the darkness you shine And out of the ashes we rise There's no Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I Just 
Our reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, which also happens to be my uh, assigned reading for Scripture 3 today, so thank you to whoever did that. It's great to double dip. <laughs> John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there, there were six stone jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding about 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. And when the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who draw the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have already become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. 
Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. The word of God. One of the things I get to hear um, in passing and in conversation from faculty time and time again um, is the incredible giftedness, particular skills, remarkable abilities of so many of our students, of all of our students in all different kinds of ways. It is such a joy and a pleasure to hear these things and we are so proud of you all. Today we have the privilege of giving some specific awards to students that have been selected by faculty for their particular unique gifts. And I'm so excited to be able to present this today. Uh, I'm going to ask each one of you to come up uh, when the award is called and, and uh, we'll have the opportunity to present that. So to begin, we have the Zondervan Biblical Greek Award for Jonathan Soder. Jonathan, please come. <laughs> Receiving the Zondervan Biblical Hebrew Award, Maddie Ely. The Zondervan Theology Award goes to Mandy Becker. All right. The William C. Treadwell Jr. Award of Excellence in Christian Education goes to Carlisle Davidizer. And the Robert Jackson Robinson Outstanding Student Preacher Award goes to Rebecca Stempniak. So today, one of our award winners will present a sermon. Um, will share with us the word of God as she has listened for the spirit. And so it's my pleasure to introduce her today. She's from Anderson, South Carolina, and still considers the East Coast to be home. She was able to get a bachelor's degree in recreation management at Appalachian State University and not surprisingly loves every opportunity to get outside. So she likes to walk her dog Lily, take a hike, camp and participate in any form of paddle sport. She also loves really good fiction, as do I, and works to find the very best cup of coffee wherever she finds herself. She's looking forward to graduating with her MDiv in August. Congratulations. We're happy for you. And she's excited to take her next steps after Truett. Thank you, Rebecca, for inviting us to hear the word of the Lord as you have heard it this morning. Please come. One of my favorite outdoor companies, Kodopaxi, makes various clothes and backpacks for outdoor enthusiasts. They try to be as sustainable as possible with a goal of having zero waste when they're making their products. 
There's this specific line of bags where they take scraps from other bags that they've made and they throw it all together and it ends up being the most colorful and vibrant bag that I think they sell. They're so committed to this vision that by 2025, they hope to create all of their products using repurposed, recycled, and responsible materials. Clothes and backpacks remade. In the early 2000s, the Lego company was on the brink of collapse. The only hope that they had was to rebrand themselves. So they continued making their beloved Lego toys, but they started making movies, which if you haven't seen them, I highly recommend, they're hilarious. And they've even opened up stores with mini car racing and different rides inside. A toy company, remade. Many people today have become enraptured with thrifting. Friends will go on thrifting excursions together and hunt for the gems of pieces that there are to find. People will seek out quirky things or even brand new items that have been thrown out and discarded from somebody else's wardrobe, and they've claimed them and decided to give them new life in their own. An old shirt, dress, or pants, remade. Have you ever wanted to start over? Have you ever wanted to be or do something different? Have you ever wanted the world to be different than it is right now? Have you ever wanted your life or the world to be remade? In our text for today from John's Gospel, we find a story of remaking. An ordinary wedding celebration in Cana becomes an opportunity for Jesus to remake people and things for God's glory. This story is best known for its miraculous sign at the center, the remaking of water to wine. It's not just water that's being remade in this story, though. The whole story is about remaking. We see imaginations, things, and people all remade for the glory of God. For you see, Jesus is in the business of remaking. Jesus is in the business of remaking our imaginations. In this text, we found ourselves at a wedding, specifically at a wedding on the third day. Jesus, the disciples, and Mary, or the mother of Jesus, as she's referred to both times in the Gospel of John, are all there. We know that Mary is involved in the hosting of this celebration because of how concerned she is about the wine running out. For you see, it would be really embarrassing for the hosting family to run out of wine at a wedding. And it is with great trust that Mary comes to Jesus with expectation of his ability and his concern for this problem to be solved. Mary's trust allows her to imagine Jesus being concerned and able to solve this issue of no wine. And while this trust is not misplaced, Jesus goes on to point out that Mary's imagination does not include the full scope of God's glory. Mary cannot even imagine what is to come. This is Mary's first glimpse of Christ's resurrection power. And it's not something that she's going to fully understand until after her time at the foot of the cross. If Mary is going to understand God's glory, her imagination is going to need to be remade. Can you imagine the work that God is doing? The summer after my freshman year of high school, I had the chance to go on a choir tour with my high school church choir to Romania. At this point in my life, if you were to ask me what I wanted to do when I was older, I would have told you that I was gonna go play basketball in college and I would figure out the rest of it afterward. Because of this, when we were running a day camp in Romania for some of the Roma kids, I got to be a part of the sports team. I know, shocker. My expectation going into this trip and the time leading the sports team was that I was gonna be playing soccer, doing relays, playing tag, doing all of the high intensity active sports you could possibly think of. This is how I imagined my time in Romania playing out. What happened instead was that I ended up doing sidewalk chalk and playing with bubbles with the kids that did not want to be doing the higher intensity sports or relays. 
I can still remember how upset I was that things didn't play out how I had imagined them. I wanted to play and have fun doing active things. And for me, that was what I was gifted at. That was what God had gifted me with, and I wanted to participate and give what I could for this trip and these kids. Instead, I was met by quiet and loving kids that just wanted someone to be with them, that wanted someone to play with them how they wanted to play, and I wanted someone to meet them there with love. I thank God regularly that my imagination was remade that week. Just as Mary's imagination was remade, my imagination was remade. I saw the beauty of the time that I was spending with chalk and bubbles, the time I was spending in Romania, and the rest of my life differently. I gained a new appreciation for the quiet and still activities. And my imagination was remade in such a way that I saw myself differently. I needed to recognize that I was more than just an athlete, and those kids, met me where I was there. God met me where I was. And God met me there and called me to imagine more for my life and the lives of those around me. How might God be meeting you where you are? How might God be calling you to imagine yourself, the world, and the people around you differently? Whether it be our sense of vocation, calling, and identity, I wonder how God is remaking our imaginations about ourselves, whether it be our friends, family, strangers, or even our enemies. I wonder how God is remaking our imaginations about the people around us. For you see, Christ is inviting me and inviting you to have our imaginations remade in such a way that we see the world around us in a new light, the light of resurrection. For you see, Jesus is in the business of remaking imaginations. Jesus is also in the business of remaking the ordinary in the world around us. A question that plagues the mind of many is how. We often think rationally, and when we hear something miraculous, we just want to know how. The miraculous sign of the wedding at Cana, the event that answers Mary's demand born out of trust, is Jesus remaking water into wine. How did Jesus do that? With the ordinary. It is an ordinary wedding in which this takes place. It's an ordinary request from Mary for something to be done about the wine. It is ordinary servants that went and drew ordinary water using the ordinary purification jars that were ordinarily found at this ordinary wedding. Imagine this scene with me. The sweaty servants that are tired for running around for days during the feast that has just gone on and gone on. The large crowd of people laughing and dancing to the loud music. The cold stone jars filled with water to become the best wine that will quench the thirst of many. And you see, all of this has been made good and made for God's glory. John has already made clear from the beginning of his gospel that Jesus, the Son of God, is creator. These created people and created things have been crafted by the Son of God for God's glory. And you see, in the presence of the Son of God, these ordinary things that were made for God's glory are continually remade for God's glory. When I was in first grade, we learned about the parts of plants. We were given a bean, a plastic bag, a paper towel, and a little bit of water and we were supposed to figure out how this bean grew. I found myself asking a lot of questions in these moments. First and foremost, how does a bean become a plant? I had never studied this before. And secondly, which was the most pressing to me at the time, was how can a bean grow with no soil? All we had was a bag. So the project was to take what we were given, tape this all to a windowsill, and watch it all grow. We tracked our beans' progress over a few weeks. We got to see the first root sprout, and then another, and then another, and then eventually the stem popped out, 
and we got to draw pictures and track the slow and gradual progress. And this process fascinated little first grade me. To be honest, it still fascinates me today. <laughs> Going back to April of 2021, which this is last year, my love and fascination with beans just moved to being about coffee beans. I have become genuinely fascinated with the science of coffee. And the whole science we studied in first grade is all a part of this. How does a bean go from a little thing in the ground to a tree, to being picked, to being roasted, to being bagged, to being brought home, to being ground, to being measured, to being mixed with water, to then being the most delicious beverage one can enjoy in the morning? It's truly miraculous. And for me, it's a beautiful process and reminder of growth and transformation done with the utmost care. An ordinary solid bean is taken and remade into a hot or iced liquid caffeinated beverage. While this is a small example of an ordinary thing being remade by the work of human hands, it gives us a glimpse of the promise we can have hope in our ordinary selves doing ordinary actions with the ordinary things in this world are not wasted. God is present and God's glory is evident around, in, and through the ordinary. We can also have hope that Christ is remaking the ordinary around us. It is not that the people and things around us are not made good, but we recognize that those people and things are broken. Thankfully, though, we serve a God that is in the business of remaking these ordinary and broken people and things. A God who is taking that which is ordinary and broken and breathing resurrection life into it, remaking it anew. For you see, Jesus is in the business of remaking the ordinary and the world around us. Jesus is also in the business of remaking his disciples. After all the focus has been on this sign of water becoming wine, John concludes this section informing us that as a result of this sign that revealed God's glory, Jesus' disciples believed in him. This is not a first-time belief for Jesus' disciples, though. Just before this story of the wedding at Cana, John lets the readers know that Jesus has been gathering disciples. These disciples have already experienced belief, and they have already begun to follow Jesus. What happens because they witness the glory of God, though, is that they believe again. Their witness of God's glory is an avenue of transformation for the disciples. An encounter with Jesus, the glory of God incarnate, does not and cannot leave them the same. Encountering Jesus remakes the disciples. As my time here at Truett is coming to a close, I'm able to reflect on the ways in which I have been remade in this place and by these people. The Rebecca that stepped into this place three years ago is not the same Rebecca that's walking out. And for that, I am deeply and truly thankful. For you see, I've been encountering Jesus along the way. Even in the long hours of studying and reading scripture and very deep theological works, yes, even in those moments, I have met Jesus. I have also met Jesus in the ordinary moments of hallway conversations, meals, cups of coffee, and even football tailgates with friends and mentors that I have now come to hold so dear. To be honest, I probably would not be up here preaching if it was not for the ways in which I have been transformed and remade over the past three years. And now I get to have the privilege of standing here and looking at other disciples of Christ. How has Jesus remade you? What ordinary moments, conversations, and daily routines have remade you? How is the living God remaking you 
now. For you see, this remaking is not something that just happens once. We can look back and see the ways in which we have encountered Christ and we can be thankful. We can also look at our present and our future and have hope that we are still being remade. For you see, Jesus' disciples show us that as we journey with Christ, we are continually met and continually remade. Following Christ and witnessing the glory of God is a daily occurrence that regularly remakes and transforms us. Friends, it is in these ordinary moments of life where Christ meets you. This is the work and business of Jesus remaking his disciples. What are the ways, though, that you feel Christ's work is not yet done in you or in the world? Again, we can look back and we can see the ways that Christ has been at work. And this story of remaking that we find ourselves caught up in is the same story that we can plant our hope for ourselves and for the world around us. Jesus who remade Mary's imagination, Jesus who remade the ordinary, Jesus who remade the disciples, Jesus who is in the business of remaking, is still remaking you, is still remaking me, and is remaking the world around us. And this is the Christian hope that we cling to, the resurrection hope that we proclaim we were just able to gather last week as the body of Christ to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. On that day, we gathered together to celebrate the work that Christ did on the cross and in the empty tomb. And we were able to celebrate the significance that it carries to us today. For you see, the bold hope that we have and that we claim is that Jesus did not just resurrect his own self and his own body. He resurrected is resurrecting, and will continue to resurrect all people and all things for all time. This resurrection promise is a promise of remaking. I can stand here before you and claim to have hope. Claim to have hope for myself, for you, and for the world around us, because Jesus remade water into wine, death into life, has remade me, has remade you, and promises to continue to remake all until it is perfectly God's kingdom. And we can have this hope all because we follow a Jesus who's in the business of remaking. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rebecca, for that word. Will you stand as we continue to sing this morning, Lord, I need you. The words are printed in your order of worship. Your grace is more than where grace is. 
May the Lord be with you all. May the Lord continue to remake your conversations, your studies, and your interactions with your neighbors. May the Lord bless you and keep you today as you leave this place. Thank you, God, for this time that you've given us today. It's in your name that we pray these things. Amen. <laughs>